Hello, we are here at the SMS conference in Baltimore and uh, I am with Professor uh, Brad Gibson who is Director of, the chemist at, of Chemistry at the Buck Institute. So thanks for being with us, Professor. Yeah. I have uh, some questions for you and my first one is how has the field of proteomics evolved and where is it going? Well, you know, I started doing uh, mass spectrometry and protein chemistry when I was a graduate student at MIT starting back in 1979. That was a decade or more before proteomics became a term. And proteomics started many, many years later. So I've watched it evolve from a really a field where there was only three or four laboratories in the world doing it. And we were working on one protein at a time. And now there's hundreds of laboratories doing this. And we're working on thousands of in tens of thousands of proteins at the, at a, at the, you know, at a time. So obviously our ability to address the larger landscape of, of the proteome, um, which was a term of which, which has also come about in the last 10, 15 years, you know, is now made possible by new technologies. So but one of my pet peeves or one of the things I worry about in this field as we go to more omics and we go to thinking of hundreds of proteins and thousands and networks, we lose sight of the fact that we have individual proteins, each one. Uh, is amazingly complicated. Each one exists as a whole ensemble of, of isoforms. So you don't, you know, somebody says, oh, this protein here exists in the, you know, in the cytoplasm. Well, actually, it's 15 different proteins that are modified that could have different locations and different turnovers, different partners, etc. So I think one thing that we've evolved is to start to appreciate the complexity uh, and of the problem we're up against, so which is enormous. Yeah. <laughs> okay. My second question is, um, what are you hoping to learn from your attendance at uh, ASMS uh, conference this year? To, how about I learn to survive the week? Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting, right? You know, getting back, I, my first meeting I attended uh, ASMS was in New York in 1980 when I was a first year graduate student. And I think there was seven or 800 people. And it was one oral session. And <laughs> you, you basically knew everybody. And so now, I mean, it's like, what, 8,000 people, and I walk around, and I don't know anybody. Well, I know a lot of people, but still, you'll see hundreds of people you don't recognize. Yeah. So survival is one thing. Running into people that I need to talk to is, is a big thing. But I think coming away with a sense, what are the kind of really exciting new technologies? What are some of the not exciting applications that people are doing? And, you know, and I get that. I try to make it to the posters and talks, but I'll tell you, I've made it to two posters today, three posters and one talk. And I probably talked to five or six colleagues for like two hours, <laughs> which is where I get most of my information. So a lot of networking is going on. Okay. Um, I leave it to my graduate students and postdocs to filter in and really do all the uh, fine tuning of, of, you know, talking to post people on the, at the poster sessions, etc. And I do mostly networking. Yeah. So that's what I hope to accomplish. <laughs> okay. And uh, what is the focus of your research and what answers uh, do you hope to find? Well, I got a lot of different things I study right now. I you know, work at the Buck Institute, which is, is actually for an institute. We focus on research in aging. So we're interested in, in diseases of aging like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, diabetes, etc. And we're also interested in basic biology of aging. So. I have projects in neurogenic disease, I have projects looking at very fundamental questions about how, you know, how a specific protein might play out regulating lifespan, whether you're going from yeast to Drosophila to C. elegans to a mouse to a human being. Um, I think one of the key things, and this is something I had a meeting Saturday at, at the Gladstone Institute at UCSF before I took the flight out here, and we were looking at metabolic dysregulation mostly related to diabetes. And it was a few colleagues from Harvard and at Duke and the Gladstone and myself were there. And it was interesting, the front page of the New York Times had a story about the incidence of non-alcoholic steatosis, which is fatty liver disease, where you only used to see this in people who are 50 years old and were alcoholic. Now you're seeing it in kids who are 15 years old and obese, and they may need liver transplants. So it's a horrifying uh, thing as we look about obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes, and things like fatty liver disease, which is one of the consequences of eating unhealthy diets um, with lack of exercise. We're only starting to understand how that dynamics is playing out. And one of my areas of research is really understanding the metabolic fine tuning that takes place and why some diets are really bad for us and why other ones are good for us. And how do we, how might we control these pathways so we can avoid, you know, some of these disastrous, um, used to be age related, Things, but now we're showing up in children. So 
Um, yeah, you know, and so being able to use mass spectrometry technology for both metabolomics and proteomics is really critical to, to that kind of research project. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. And um, my last question for you. <laughs> How has AB Science uh, technology uh, contributed to your research objectives? Well, you know, I just, uh, you know, I just had a new instrument uh, delivered two weeks ago. That was the uh, Triple Talk 6600. And it doesn't have specifications yet. They just released it. They're not going to deliver till August, but we have it in the lab already. And it's interesting. We've been evaluating it for the last couple of weeks. Um, that was torn out of an engineer's hands in, uh, in Canada, apparently, to get it into my lab in mid-May so that we could have some experience before this conference started. And uh, already it's looking really interesting. Um, one of the things I'm particularly interested about it is in, in, a, in the data independent acquisition, the swath acquisition, um, they've made new software improvements in there, but from an instrumentation standpoint, they've increased the dynamic range of the detector. And that becomes really important when you're looking at large mixtures or even a single protein, and you're looking for low occurrence events, maybe a phosphorylation or acetylation event that takes place. It's really hard to find these in, the, in, in a very dynamic, complex background. So having more dynamic range in our what we're able to observe allows us to dig deeper. It's just like a forest. We can get deep, you know, go down down to the plant level where we might have been able to only stop at you know at, a, at the five foot level before. Now we can go down to the one foot level and the six inch level as we explore the terrain and the landscape. So that's going to be a huge thing. And faster acquisition as we find ways to. A sample, essentially ta tackle a sample by trying to sample everything or as much as possible. And these are some of the new technologies that AV Science has been developing with, with people like Rudy Abersol and others who have been pushing this technology. So, um, that, you know, it's been a big thing. Um, we're very excited about the performance of the new instrumentation, and yeah, we're hoping that'll give us a competitive edge as we fight up our colleagues for <laughs> money and prestige. <laughs> Anyhow, uh -huh. and hopefully we learn some great science. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very okay. much. Thank you for your time. You're and welcome. enjoy the conference. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. All right. Got it.